My name is Nairi Woods and I'm Dean of the Blavatnik School of Government at Oxford University. We've had a long day. Some of you now need to move. I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that right off the bat. So could I ask you, how many of you work in a country which is different <coughs> to your country of birth? Hand in the air, wave it round, get your blood going. Oh my. Okay, so it is as I suspected a very large number of people in this room. <coughs> and I think so far today, there's been a sense that migration is a good thing and that it's something that everybody on the continent wants. So let's start straight in on that question because the Pew Research, the Pew Research of 2018 tells us something different. They look at 27 countries and they tell us that in the four African countries they surveyed, a large number of people have said they want less immigration. So in South Africa, some 65% of the South Africans they surveyed said they want less immigration. In Kenya, 60%. In Nigeria, 50%. And in Tunisia, 42%. So I worry that maybe it's we, the elite, that think <clears throat> that the modern world is a war for talent. Let's attract the best and brightest. But the populations of the countries we live in are not fully behind us on that. So I'm going to introduce panelists as I invite them to make comments. And the very first person I'd like to comment on this, but specifically to tell us what is the way to manage that is Albert Mudenda Muchanga, who's now at the African Union, the Commissioner for Trade and Industry, but is originally from Zambia, where he served in government. In Zambia in 2016, there were very significant anti-immigration riots. So, Albert, if I could ask you to kick off today with what is it that governments on the African continent need to do to create an environment where immigration would be more welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, moderator, and good afternoon, uh, all distinguished uh, participants in this uh, uh, forum. Uh, it's a very, very difficult question. It has uh, no easy answer. I think uh, the basic issue is that uh, Sometimes uh, there is no connection between uh, the leaders and the, the populations in the country. Because uh, uh, when the leaders come to the African Union, they show great commitment to the question of uh, creating one Africa with common uh, African values and they sign on to some of those commitments. The latest of which is the protocol on the free movement of uh, people, right of establishment and right of residence, which in addition to giving those rights would also enable uh, learning institutions to have mutual recognition of academic qualifications. So at the le that, that level, the matter is settled. But now when you bring the matter to the individual level, mm -hmm. there is no understanding and no appreciation. So there's need for regular contact among the, uh, the, 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 the populations and the political leaders that uh, they've established. And uh, one, of the, um, uh, one of the ways of ensuring that is to find a mechanism of bringing the agreements made at the continental level to the community level. And you need to come up with the national committees. For example, under the African continental free trade area, we are going to have national committees on the implementation of the African continental free trade area at the national level, which is going to involve participants from the executive wing of government, the legislative wing of government, academia, the private sector, 
youth, women, and other interest groups. When there is that communication, then there will be greater appreciation. Now, the other end is that the individuals do not see the benefits of migrants. A time will come when there's going to be greater demand for labor because of increased economic activity. And there may be uh, labor shortages at the domestic level. Mm -hmm. That is not appreciated. But at a later stage, when the rate of economic growth uh, increases, I think it will be appreciated. So basically, the problem is that uh, there is a lack of information flows between the politicians who are very committed to Pan-Africanism and the people on the lower end of the scale. And it's not just in Africa. We have similar experiences in other parts of the world. And while I have the floor, although this is a session not on African economic integration, uh, I hope I can give and be given about five minutes or so to answer some of the questions which were raised uh, by uh, uh, Dangote during the one-on-one -on -one conference. Right, Thank I'll, you. I'll stop, yes, I'll, I'll stop you there for a moment because two big thoughts from Commissioner Muchanga there. The first is about the lack of connection between leaders and their people. And I think in a very diplomatic way, perhaps you're telling us that the free trade agreement for the continent needs to have much more buy-in from society, NGOs and people on the ground. And your second point takes us to the fact that where there, are, where there is unemployment, where there is a shortage of jobs, people that can't get those jobs are unlikely to welcome migrants who they see as taking those jobs. But let me take the first of those issues. Arancha Gonzalez, you're executive director of the International Trade Center. Yes. So what do you think of this idea that it's all very well for governments to sign agreements like the Continental Free Trade Agreement with each other, but they're not doing enough to connect those agreements to the people, to consult with society. What, what would you say to that? Yeah, and I think uh, you're absolutely right that there, in, and I like the idea that Albert introduced, which is one of disconnect. And in this discussion on migration, or shall we rather say mobility, there are many disconnects. There is the disconnect between the politicians uh, and uh, citizens, let's say, elites as we call them today, and citizens. Uh, but there are many more disconnects in this discussion. There is a disconnect between how much we talk about migration, mobility, mm -hmm. and how little we do. Mm -hmm. The countries where my mobility works are the countries that manage mobility, that don't let mobility purely to market forces, that don't let mobility purely to uh, populist uh, discourse. These are countries that are matching skills needs with the skills availability. You may have, uh, Neri, a country with a huge unemployment rate, but you would still welcome uh, migrants simply because they are not addressing the same segments of the labor market. So uh, we have to connect better the offer with the demand. Second disconnect, uh, and uh, this is a tougher one, is the disconnect between the economics of mobility and the social cultural aspects of mobility. Mm -hmm. So we do a lot in terms of churning numbers, uh, how much uh, mobility benefits recipient countries and remittances and, uh, and so on and so forth. But we forget that a lot of the hard feelings towards migrants have to do with the fact that they are very often different Different in religion, different in culture, different in color, different in uh, uh, sexual preferences. And this part also needs to be discussed. And this part needs to also be managed. And it has to do uh, with understanding that at the end of the day, diversity, which is what mobility introduces, means strength. This is uh, what uh, we need to use uh, as a leading, uh, let's say, argument. Mm -hmm. I'd like to throw this question to you now and take two answers from the floor. What is it you think governments should be doing on this continent to make migration something which the people will themselves embrace? So what, what are some of the things you think governments should be doing to quell the anti-immigration if, if they should? Any thoughts? We're crowdsourcing. <laughs> 
so far unsuccessfully. Yes, from the front, President Mohai. Thank you very much. I think that <clears throat> leaders should explain to their populations the facts that we, we ourselves have learned from the presentations uh, on, on this occasion, that migrants often benefit the countries into which they migrate. In my country, up to five, ten years ago, that was the case. People appreciated that the people who came in from South Africa and Zimbabwe were more qualified than the most of Botswana, and they were most welcome. But now it has changed, because they now say that they are taking their jobs. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the thing, this perception about foreigners taking their jobs, mm -hmm. the local jobs, mm -hmm. that's what African leaders should fight against, by explaining the actual that nationally they benefit. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And President Mohai, just before you sit down, in Botswana, what has changed? Is it the jobs that the immigrants are taking that have changed, or is it the communication from the I, government? I think now we have unemployment. Mm -hmm. um, some of, of course, is uh, inappropriate skills of the locals, mm -hmm. uh, as I mentioned yesterday. Mm -hmm. But then when they don't get the jobs, and either government and companies import people with appropriate skills, mm -hmm. the perception of the locals is that they are preferring foreigners to us, mm -hmm. when that is not the case. Mm -hmm. So I think it behoves government to go out of their way to, exp to explain again and again what is actually happening, mm -hmm. and that they, the citizens, benefit from immigration. Thank you, President Thank you. Mohai. So, yes, we've got one, one more, um, two more quick interventions. Sir, you and the lady behind you afterwards. Yes. Um, if you could use the microphone. Okay. My name is Andrew Brahm Wilde Georgis. Mm -hmm. I am head of uh, ERI platform, which promotes rule of law, mm -hmm. democratic governance, and respect for human rights. I think there are three things that governments can do to encourage Africans to stay home and contribute to development. One is enhance governance, mm -hmm. both in the economic and political sense. Two, expand education at the primary, secondary, and tertiary levels relevant to market demand. And third, stop capital flight in order to encourage domestic investment and most of all, establish rule of law in, this, in their respective countries in order to also attract foreign direct investment. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And behind you, the lady. Hello, my name is Rasha Hafer. I'm from Tunisia, and I actually work on human trafficking that will be mentioned later. However, now I think it's very important that we work on changing the narratives. Mm -hmm. I think media play a very crucial yeah. role on showing the stories of the migrants. Mm -hmm. um, the story is always talked about you know, from the other perspective, who they are, but not mm -hmm. who we are, actually. So the stories of the people who migrate should be talked about. Their success stories, the, 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 the income and the jobs they create with the entrepreneur, you know, the entrepreneurial aspect, the tech, technology they bring to the country with their companies, the new aspects they bring. So I think that's the most important thing, the change in the narrative, the media, the use of the stories should be focused from the point of view of the migrant themselves, not from the, the people who receive them in their countries. Thank you very much. That's an excellent point. And I know the now generation discussed this yesterday, the role that social media is playing in intensifying and concentrating anti-immigrant feeling in lots of countries on the continent, and particularly during election times. So that's, that's one thing that, as a group, we need to keep our eyes on. Let me move now to introducing a couple more of our speakers and to raising a second issue that keeps rising up today. We've talked a lot about jobs. How do you deal with the unemployment problem? And I think every single person in this room has sat in many rooms like this hearing people talk about skills, education, mobility. 
So I'm not going to ask any of you to rehearse skills, education, mobility. I'm going to ask you instead to focus what is it, what is one thing that needs to be done or that has been done that clearly works in that domain. And I think we heard in the last session two points from the floor that are really important to this. The first is the role that government must play in enabling business, not rent-seeking business, but enabling small startup business, enabling people to actually build businesses which work, whether in the agriculture sector or in the industrial sector. And a second was about the public sector, which three or four different questioners asked. What role does the public sector play? At the moment, in too many countries in the continent, the public sector is the parking lot where people sit and take a salary. What if, like, as in some parts of Asia, it were the incubator of highly trained, meritocratically promoted, skilled workers that were actively sought out by the private sector? So to each of you, Picking one of those themes, or, or one of the themes that you would like to see the most, what do you think is, what do you want to see people in this room taking away as something they will work on to enable more jobs to be created on the continent? And I'm going to start at the end with Nasser Louis who is one of the now generation, an engineer, currently um, doing his MBA in London. So Nasser, what would you do? One thing that you see working that you think you'd like people to take away and think about? Sure. Um, thank you for having me. So we were thinking yesterday in the conversation about why people move around. And there's been a lot of conversation today about why that happens. Um, and so if we start from there and say people will move, we're thinking about what their experience will be as they move around. We then talked about making sure that they stay on the continent, and I'll touch on one of the reasons that people will stay. So in the, in the, uh, the Ibrahim Index, there's, there's a section on sustainable economic opportunity. Mm -hmm. And that's a big collective term for mm -hmm. jobs, effectively. And one important element that needs government intervention you were just touching on is providing an environment where business can thrive. Mm -hmm. And so there's several layers to this. So if you'll allow me, I'll try and go through a few of them. <coughs> you may have people that are looking for educational opportunities. And if we ask ourselves why they'd stay in Africa, we think when they get to a new, South, a new African university, mm -hmm. is it the kind of place that still has world-class lecturers that they had in the past and would attract an African migrant from going to that school? When you think of people who are looking to access vocational training, can they find that in the educational sphere? And when they find it, can we give them the mindset? Can we change it for them to believe that this is not a second class outcome for themselves? That this is what happens to you when you don't make it in the private sector. But we were speaking earlier today that farming is cool. Right, and also to understand that entrepreneurs are not only Mark Zuckerberg or Dr. Ibrahim, mm -hmm. but entrepreneurs are also the electrician that bought a van and is installing solar panels on people's roofs. Mm -hmm. And then one last one, which would be people who have a university degree and are trying to enter this private workspace. Mm -hmm. Why do they not have enough jobs? That's a big topic. But one thing that they could hope to see is that the governments have created the right environment, that the incentives are correct for people to create businesses and create job opportunities for them, and that issues like corruption don't stand in the way of people creating those businesses that open up the job space. Mm -hmm. So a, a good account of how important it is for the, the group in the now generation, government get the, get the barriers out the way to coming back with an education and starting a business. Let me ask um, Umar Saidi, who is the Africa Gates Foundation head, but previously was in the IFC of the World Bank. So you've got a lifetime of experience of trying to get investors to come to the continent. So on that issue, and we'll move to the other issues that you're working on now, but on the, the kind of your experience of the IFC, what are some of the things that work to attract job-creating investment? Well, um, 
Today I will be focusing more on what I'm doing in my current job, mm -hmm. but if I were to say a few words about, mm -hmm. I guess what I practiced for the past uh, two decades uh, in this continent, um, first of all, it takes two to do the dance. Um, so you have the private sector here uh, that opens up um, channels that makes it possible for those jobs to be seen or to be created. Mm -hmm. But the private sector also would work with government uh, to make sure that the things that they see that the government doesn't see, mm -hmm. that those things are taken into account. Mm -hmm. So we were always very excited every time we produced the doing business report mm -hmm. and then work with government to look at very specifically where they rank uh, in that report and the issues that they needed to tackle in order to be where they were supposed to be. And what was very interesting um, at the time was that it was a bit of a, uh, I guess, an incentive uh, lifting people up rather than down. There are certain countries when the report is out, the first thing they do is to look at what the neighbor did. <laughs> and so it did provide a, a very healthy incentive to really look into something that was very uh, important. Mm -hmm. And over time that we've seen really scores really surprise us. Um, countries going 44 places just in two years. And when you look at the business pulse, actually, you will see that it was reflecting that. But I was hoping at some point also to talk I'm, about a different subject. Yes, and I'm going to come back to that. Which is referred to in this, in this yep. uh, data as the elephant in the room. Umar, can I just, on what you just said, though, a tip for those in the room who are wanting to attract foreign investment, what do you think, from your experience of the Doing Business Survey, what would you put as right up there as important for a government that can't focus on everything but can focus on one or two things? So this was the big misconception because when you think that just taking care of electricity uh, is a problem, that you realize that actually before you even get there, there's you know, you don't even have a way to open, uh, let's say, a business. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at the barriers. So honestly, you can't just look at one single thing. Mm -hmm. It is really a package. Mm -hmm. And at any given time, in one piece of the package is not actually working. Mm -hmm. uh, it affects the other parts. Mm -hmm. So that was a big misconception. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, you don't just wake up overnight and just suddenly become a, a, you know, a, a country uh, that attracts business. Mm -hmm. So it is something that you do over and over again. Mm -hmm. This is a world that is very, very competitive. Mm -hmm. You have investors like Aliko, uh, Dangote, when they go to a place, they don't just look at one thing. So they have the money to spend. Mm -hmm. So it is you would give them a reason why they would invest in your country rather than the country before. Incidentally, it used to be one of my clients. Mm -hmm. And now we are very much linked working on a foundation together. Right. So that's the other piece I was hoping also I'll get into uh, at a given time. Uh, so look right course. across the business environment. Albert Muchanga, you were a minister in Zambia before you took on your current role in the African Union. Is there something from your experience in government about making the environment easier to set up business? What is it you would have loved to have done if you could have, but perhaps you couldn't? <laughs> well, uh, it's true. Uh, you need to make uh, continuous reforms and provide incentives for uh, business to come in. When the cost of doing business is lower, uh, people get it attracted to, uh, to have their money. And if they are confident that uh, they'll be able to make their money without any undue hindrances, mm -hmm. then they can come in. So I think you really need to give a framework where people are certain that mm -hmm. they can make large-scale investments and long-term investments. Mm -hmm. When I was back in Zambia, I was in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I was mm -hmm. not directly involved in the ministry involved with the trade and the industry. Mm -hmm. But uh, as a trend economist, the issue of creating certainty in the operating environment is very, very key. Mm -hmm. The investors should be uh, very, very certain that when they put in their money, mm -hmm. they will be able to do uh, anything within the law, make sure that uh, they get the objectives of wh what they wanted to do in the first place when they went in. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, it's um, Oli Diba Wada, who is originally from Gambia, and now working in the African Development Bank. Now, you work particularly on human resources, on, on, on being a, a coach to executives and such like. Um, 
If you were offering advice to the people in the public sector who are here, what's the one thing they should change in their personnel practice to really make sure they're getting the brightest people and getting the best work out of them? It's a tough question, and I'm going to come back to you on the broader education issues in a moment, but just I, on that I think, question. I think uh, the first thing that um, policymakers should, should remember is, as, as a leader, mm. that one of the key qualities that you need to have is empathy. Mm -hmm. Because when you are empathic, you put your, shoe, your, your feet in other people's shoes, you feel the pain, and then you get to realize and you get to hear and listen and understand what people are going through. And if you, if you lack that empathy, mm -hmm. um, a lot of these things you wouldn't be able to. You, you, you keep focusing on a lot of macro things without really seeing how you can serve the people that, mm -hmm. that, 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 that um, you know, in the country. Thank you. And that's backed, of course, by a huge body of evidence. The number one quality of a great manager is his or her ability to be a great coach. And there's a, a ton of people analytics data behind that. So thanks for reminding us of that. Arantxa, what is, it that, that, what is it that you think governments absolutely need to be doing to create the enabling environment as two of the young people spoke of for, for business startups on this continent? Well, let me say that the, the first thing is the job market is probably the toughest issue uh, that any policymaker needs to deal with today because there are too many moving pieces at the same time. The fourth industrial revolution, digitalization, disintermediation, ecological transition, all of this is coming at once. So in any country on earth, the governments that are really looking at shaping the job market have a very tough job. And there is no one button that they have to, they can push that can fix the problem. But I would say uh, a very, important uh, ingredient is to understand where are the jobs going to come from. Mm -hmm. uh, the jobs can come in three different ways. They can come from the public sector. We've discussed already there is finite uh, possibilities in the public sector. The jobs can come from employing others. That's one part, but this is a part that is not growing enormously worldwide. And the part that is growing worldwide is people that are self-employed. This is called entrepreneurship. And there, uh, in my view, uh, one thing that we need to do a little bit better, starting in this continent, is celebrating the local entrepreneurs. Now, uh, we obviously have Aliko Dangote here. We have to celebrate uh, the big entrepreneurs. But 99% of entrepreneurs in this continent are small and medium enterprises. Micro-entrepreneurs, startups, I am tired of listening uh, about Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, and Jack Ma. I want you to celebrate local businesses, local businessmen, and if possible, business women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you don't know where to find them, let me give you a little list. <laughs> Chisa Makonen, she produces garments in Ghana. Sonia Mugabo, amazing designer in Rwanda. Zinga, Sophie Zinga, another amazing designer in Senegal. Simba Women, IT solutions, software solutions uh, for SMEs in Uganda. And last but not least, because I could go on all afternoon, Monica Muzonda, Java Foods from Zambia. All of this is what we have to celebrate. Thank you. Thank you, Arancha. I'm going to come to the, to the audience on the public sector issue. Why is it in so many countries that, for example, the brightest young graduates from the School of Government at Oxford, where I teach, we persuade them to come back home to work in the public service. They're not allowed to compete on merit for jobs in the public service, whether it's Nigeria or elsewhere. What is it we need to do? Which countries are doing better? Do you have any suggestions on better equipping the public sector to do what it needs to do on the continent. Our panelists have told us some of the things that we need the public sector to do better. So any thoughts from the audience on this, or indeed questions to our panelists on this issue of the public sector? Over here, please. Microphone. 
Over to here. Hi, yeah, my name is Nikki. Hi again. Um, I think the problem with the public sector and, and our leaders is the fact that we are asked to come with great ambitious ideas, Agenda 2063 or the free trade agreements or any other ideas that you have. But we don't think about the practicality of implementing those um, ideas and the fact that we don't have institutions that can even survive independently implementing those things. So when we have great graduates going back home to work for institutions, they have been stu they've studied, they've experienced uh, the UK or Belgium or Netherlands or whatever else, and then they come home to a place that's not up to that standard yet, and they're stuck. What do you do then? Because they are asked to run on a treadmill that's wood. So it's just it's sort of, are we asking people to Maybe it's a question to you. Are we asking then all these young people to come home and be stagnant because there's no place for them? Mm -hmm. They are thinking on two separate tracks. Mm -hmm. We have great ideas that they can implement, they can work on these institutions, mm -hmm. but our leaders and our governments and our institutions do not have space for them. Mm -hmm. So are we just sort of mm -hmm. causing a clash? Thank you, thank you. An important point. And of course, if you, if you went back to the years after, after colonization, the public services on this continent really did attract the best and brightest, and they really did throw their backs into public service. So it's, you know, it is something that has been done and could be done again. We had some more suggestions from in here. Yeah, just there, please. Is there a microphone? Yeah, just coming. Yeah, thank you very much. My name is Augustine from Tanzania. I'm representing Restless Development, uh, and I'm also a public policy blog. I blog about public policy in my own right. Um, so uh, I think the public sector needs to improve in, in public financial management um, in terms of uh, controlling corruption, but also um, in, um, in rewarding its, its workers, um, which will improve efficiency and uh, improve pro productivity of workers in the public sector. It will also attract um, young talents to work in the public sector. Mm -hmm. For example, in Tanzania, uh, there's the, the youth have the views to prefer working in the public and private sector, mm -hmm. while uh, the older generation prefers their children uh, to choose the, the, the public sector as their first uh, employment uh, base. Mm -hmm. But then young, most young people do not want to work in the, uh, in the public sector because um, there's no much good incentives mm -hmm. compared to, uh, to, to the mm -hmm. private sector, mm -hmm. but also productivity in, mm -hmm. the, in the public sector. Because as a young person, you don't want to risk your career starting working in the public sector, mm -hmm. where you want to start like your first career, you have to grow mm -hmm. to be able to um, take on uh, um, higher positions. Mm -hmm. So a better public financial management mm -hmm. will lead to these spillover effects. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Important um, sense of the difficult choices for young people coming into their jobs if they want to work in the public sector. Any other quick suggestions from the audience? One here, Shamai, and then the lady behind you. Yes, I think we, we talk about the incentive. There are the financial incentives. Uh, there are also the sense of pride, which is key. And I think in a number of places, and it's not unique to Africa, there's not much pride now in working for the uh, public sector. So if you don't get great compensation, if you feel that the other people will believe you're in the, private sec in the public sector just because you can find a better job, uh, that's not fantastic. Uh, one is not going to change that all at once. I think one has to build bridges between the public sector and the private sector, mm -hmm. so that in the course of your career, you can move from one to the other. Maybe you have made some money in the, in the private sector, but you want to give back mm -hmm. through the public sector. There has to be that possibility, mm -hmm. so that the image of the public sector is not something that you choose for life, mm -hmm. and that where you will succeed or fail, but you combine the two. Thank you. And excellent um, point about shifting between the sectors. And if you pass it behind you, to the lady behind you, yes. Another thought? Yes, so I come from a country uh, where there is a lot of diaspora. It's one-fifth of the population, Comoros. Mm -hmm. 
And I've been on the experience of coming back to my country as a French and Comorian. And what I've noticed in the public sector especially is that something that will really prevent people to come is the lack of recruitment policies. In the public sector, we nominate people. And the nomination just aspect is uh, killing the will of people who want to give the skills and to, to work and be recognized by the skills to work. And this thing, I think, is easy to change. We should just organize national competition and just promote the skills of people and make sure that on the top, so for, for me, it's really the, the people who can uh, organize the, uh, the public sector that will come, not the little volunteers, because it's discouraging. It has to be from the top, people coming to organize and uh, really focus on the recruitment. Thank you. Excellent. Is Jin Yong, is Ji Yong Sai here? Is he here? I threatened to call him in on this one. No, then the lady there. Can I? Where is he? Can I? I'm here. Thank you. Where is he? Thank you. My name is uh, Mamadou Jallo. I'm the Deputy General Secretary of the International Trade Union Confederation. Where is this person? Uh, you, you can't see me. I'm here. Ah, Hello. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm slow, but I get there. Thank, thank you very you. much. Mamadou. So, thank you. First of all, I think we need to ask governments and international financial institutions to stop cutting budget for public services. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We know that almost 80% of people in Africa are dependent mm -hmm. to public services mm -hmm. and needs access to essential uh, also needs. Mm -hmm. And we think that if we change the policy of providing more resources in the public sector and giving more space also to young people to enter this sector and develop their skills, we will be able to change the, the situation, the current situation, and also we can improve people's lives. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like, without putting you on the spot, Amin Mohammed and Ali Kodangoti, I would like to ask each of you, since we've had this suggestion from the audience, what can you do in Nigeria to open up public service jobs to genuine merit-based competition? Any thoughts? Without putting you on the spot, could we have a microphone to each of them? Can we have a microphone up here, please? Yep, come right to the front. We won't bite. Right across, yep. They're really enthusiastic. <laughs> yes, absolutely. More public sector jobs in Nigeria. How can you, we, we were talking before about brilliant graduates going back to Nigeria, wanting to join the public service. They cannot get in. They're not permitted to compete for jobs. What would you do to open that up, to permit them to compete as they might do in other countries for jobs in the public service? I think then we would have to change the policy and make the incentives such that younger people can come in mm -hmm. than are actually coming in right now. I mean, there's a huge, um, there's a huge demand for public sector work, yeah. um, and there are, in a federal system, very complicated mm -hmm. um, policy guidelines for that that we have to fulfill because every part of the country has got to have representation. So it does make it difficult when you're coming back. Mm -hmm. But there have been some incentives that some states have um, put in place, like Lagos State, mm -hmm. Um, to encourage those in diaspora coming back. So it, it's not impossible, but we do have to work state by state on some of those um, uh, policies. It's a policy change. Thank you, Amina Mohammed. Well, thank, thank you. Thank At you. the federal level, uh, just like what uh, my sister said, Amina Mohammed, uh, we have to, we give jobs based on where you come from. Mm -hmm. So there is federal character Commission of which they always look at, uh, you know, how jobs are, you know, given. That's number one. Number two, they actually they are not employing much. They try to encourage more people to go into public, I mean, private sector. Mm -hmm. You know, because government they have to, they have too many people. If you look at it, mm -hmm. we use almost about more than 80 percent mm -hmm. or 70 something percent. I can't remember the figures of our own revenue mm -hmm. in paying salaries, which really doesn't make any sense at all. Mm -hmm. 
Smaller, more effective. Yes. <laughs> right. Thank you very much. So lots of work to be done on the, on the jobs piece. Finally, the elephant in the room, Umar. You've described, we've, we've spent a whole day talking about jobs and mobility, and you've said there is an elephant in the room. What is the elephant? Well, the elephant in the room is really family planning. Uh, before I get into it, we've spent the whole day talking about investing in human capital. And the focus of investing in human capital has been more on education, skills, etc., which are very, very important factors. Mm -hmm. uh, but the other factor that we should really remind ourselves is, is also investing in health. Um, I spent a good part of my, I guess, the past two decades promoting investment in, uh, uh, in things like infrastructure, mm -hmm. building that road, building that bridge. They are very, very important. But so is investment in health. When we think about things as basic as delivering medicine and services, and you look at uh, institutions like Gavi mm -hmm. and the Global Fund, mm -hmm. every dollar that they have spent mm -hmm. in these very simple things, but very important things, mm -hmm. have actually uh, generated about $20 mm -hmm. in economic return. Mm -hmm. So I'm arguing for the business case mm -hmm. of investing in, in, in uh, human capital not just in education, but also in health. Mm -hmm. Now on health, and I think more... And I, so w w I know the president's just arriving, but can we more, cut more talked to about the family planning yeah. issue that you That's just what I'm going. So more Great. talked about it early this morning, and I've been just waiting to see whether someone will get into it. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's absolutely right. It becomes, it continues to be the elephant in the room. Now look at the data that was presented uh, by the report, in fact, uh, uh, I think a lot of us have had some aha moments in reading it. Uh, so first thing is that that data really need to be shared. And if you look at that data, mm -hmm. the youth population is expected to increase very significantly from 440 plus million mm -hmm. in 2019 mm -hmm. to about 1.3 billion mm -hmm. in, uh, by 2011. Now, this is in a context in which we all know that when you have a lower dependency ratio, mm -hmm. um, it does affect your bottom line as a country. Mm -hmm. You benefit from what we call the demographic, uh, demographic dividend. Mm -hmm. But the dependency ratios are among the highest in our countries, and people don't talk about it. I think this is very important. They're among the highest. And if you look at also data, it is also telling you that the countries that have the highest population growth have also tended to be the poorest one. This is an argument that also argue, uh, that basically says that, and in our experience, investing in, in family planning is one of the most effective tools mm -hmm. that have enabled to actually break the cycle. Mm -hmm. And it's... Uh, people dance around it, but there is a health component to it, too. Mm -hmm. Not only, obviously, it, it uh, empowers women to plan for their future and also to reach their fullest potential, but when you think about efforts like the, that was triggered after the London 2017 Family Planning uh, Summit when commitments were made, it was about 2.5 billion, and guess what? Of those commitments, more than half were actually coming from our own countries mm -hmm. where they don't actually, don't always talk about those. So it is coming from our countries. And then my final word that I want to share there is that if you look at from 2017 to 2018, yeah. just the effort associated with that has saved 130,000 maternal, maternal death. So, so thank you, Umar. So the good news is that the birth rate in this continent is gradually reducing from about 6.5 to 4.5, but it's still double the global average. So the point there is there has to be a real effort on family planning. Of course, as the other panelists have discussed before this panel, girls' education is going to be essential for that. Now, I'm afraid we, I'm not afraid, I'm delighted to say that the President Alassane Ouattara has arrived early, and we're going to have the delight of hearing him interviewed by Mo Ibrahim. 
but can I have you join me in thanking the panelists, Nasser for reminding us, Umar, Adil Muchanga, Ori, Arantxa.